From Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA, and the home of Hot Chicken, it's the Rick Altizer Show. Sit back, buckle up. Rick will talk with the movers, shakers, and creators who put Christ in Christian entertainment. He's a man who's clear so the world can hear. Here's Rick Altizer. Hey, thanks for joining me today. So today, my guest has been on the show more than any other guest I've had. He's my, I would probably say he's one of my favorite guests I've ever had because he happens to be my son, David Altizer. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. David has been on many times. He's a YouTube personality. Uh, we've talked a lot about YouTube channels and how to do a YouTube show. And, and he's also the host of a podcast called the Golden Hour Podcast, where he talks to camera uh, gear uh, people and and photographers and videographers and filmmakers and and you can uh, find information by that by searching for uh, the the golden hour podcast and um and you can also go back to my website rickaltizer.com to find many of the interviews i've had with with david uh, talking yes. about how to start a youtube channel and how to amortize a youtube channel we've done all that stuff so yeah we even had a great one we talked about fathering fathers and sons that's right it was uh, on brand with your movie, Show Me the Father, as well. So Interesting. So uh, so Dave, David is, uh, he goes by Dave Mays online. Yeah, at Dave Mays on Twitter, Dave Mays on Instagram. And um, so he's going to kind of talk to me today about some things, and he's going to use this for his, his podcast, and I'm going to use it for mine. So we're killing two birds with one stone today. Yeah, and so, uh, I'm interviewing you on your show. All right. It's kind of a meta universe kind of a thing here. But um, yeah, I mean, you've directed four movies now, five, five, five documentaries. Um, and the, m- the most amazing thing about it is uh, the first one that you did was your first ever anything f- film related <laughs> other than making, you know, random videos for with me, obviously right. Matthew and I, we would make all sorts of silly videos growing up. And then you always knew how to edit, you know, um, in a basic way with Sony Vegas and with windows movie maker. Um, I think you even knew how to use premiere back in the day too, like the older yes. CS three, Yes, um, when I had the horse on the cover. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh-huh. Those are great, great days. <laughs> and that's how I learned too, where it was on the original Adobe software. Um, but I feel like you've told this story multiple times about the Shonda film, but can you just briefly explain again how you went from music producer to all of a sudden documentarian? Um, keep it brief, because I know you've told this story multiple times. But. Well, I was working with Shonda Pierce, helping her with marketing and with music, and she said, I want to make a movie. I said, mm-hmm. I don't know how to make a movie, but I can do a demo tape yeah. like we used to in the old days. A little three-song cassette tape you'd send to a record company to get a record deal. If they liked it, they'd put you in a real studio. So I said, mm-hmm. why don't I go on the road with you for a weekend and get five minutes, and maybe somebody will like it. And so I went on the road with her, got 16 minutes. Mm-hmm. Her and her manager said, Rick, we want you to make this. We love it. And yeah. she feels comfortable talking with me. And so from there, we made uh, Laughing in the Dark, the first thing I'd ever done. I had no training, no nothing. And mm-hmm. it was a Fathom event, which was in theaters for one one night. And it was the number five movie in America the night yeah. it came out. So kind of amazing, amazing story of how so, that even happened. The reason that I, I, I think it's important to say all, all that is because that is not repeatable. Other people can't just, uh, if they want to be documentarians themselves or filmmakers, you can't just stumble a, a, across a person that's then going to offer you a, a job that you kind of do it for free. And then it turns into a theatrical release. And I think the most important piece of the puzzle is the fact that you had, what, 30 years of experience in the music industry. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, one of the things that I kind of discovered in my recent interview with your mother, my grandmother, is that you and your entire family had a baseline understanding of filmmaking and storytelling because you watched so many movies growing up. You consumed a lot of media as a child. Um, it may have been an escape for you as a younger boy. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and it was just something that was kind of ingrained in you, uh, in your family. I mean, when I talked to your mother, she grew up going to the movie theaters. It was a different generation. There was no TV or video games. And the only kind of interesting thing to do in a small town was go to a theater. So there is this baseline understanding of filmmaking and storytelling that I, I feel like you grew up with. So it's not a surprise that you have kind of an understanding of story uh how would you explain that 
how, yeah, I, how I see you... it as a, as a two, a, a kind of a, a page, you know, two pages, page one and page two. One is is just being able to understand story and tell story and communicate. But I think communication is a whole other part of that. And, yeah. you know, you're talking about my mom. My mom and I communicated very well. I grew up with a lot of communication. We mm. talked. We talked about everything. And, and we communicated. And so communication for me, I mean, here I'm on a radio show. I'm interviewing people. I'm talking. Mm-hmm. It's something, you know, and then you ended up getting the gift of gab. <laughs> yeah, I'm but communicating it, to you right now yeah, on this show. But it, it's something <laughs> It's something that I have have done my whole life is – uh, I, I have all these guy friends that I go out to lunch with and I mm. ask them questions and they tell me things. Yeah. I have many men that, you know, it's it's kind of like a like men's ministry thing that I've always had where I'll talk to them and I'll ask them questions. I'll ask them hard questions. How's your yeah. marriage? How, you know, are, are you struggling with porn? I mean, we talk about stuff that a lot of guys don't talk to and they say, Rick, sure. I've, I've never told this to anyone ever. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how many times I've had people talk to me and tell me, I'm telling you something I've never told anyone before. <laughs> Where does that come from? How do you naturally get good at that? <laughs> you know, it's just, and, and that really does tie into what we'll probably talk about today about the art of the of the documentary interview. It's about asking questions. You know, being, so many times you have a friend, and, and we've all got these friends, where you go out to lunch with them, and they just talk about themselves. They're just mm-hmm. nonstop. They never ask you a question. Yeah. You know? And if you're listening to this, don't be that guy. Don't be that person. <laughs> you know, don't be the person who just talks about themselves and never asks a question of the person you're with. Mm-hmm. And I've had that. You, know, you go out with someone and they never ask you anything. I mean, I'm making movies mm-hmm. and they won't ask me. Any, they just talk about themselves. Mm-hmm. Or and, and we we all fall into that. I mean, I fall into that too. So and, and to when I'm on the other that. side of that, yeah. when I'm with somebody, they don't ever say, "How are you doing?" How, you you know, you just you kind of feel like, well, they don't really. They don't care. Yeah, they don't care. So I've never wanted to be that guy. And my mom uh, was very much ingrained that in us, you know, very <laughs> considerate, very kind, very loving. So I would always ask questions. I've just always been that guy who would interview people. And I remember mm-hmm. in the eighth grade, uh, someone paid me a quarter to uh, a girl paid me a quarter to do uh, like therapy with her and i would just talk to her <laughs> i never heard and that ask story. her That's questions funny. yeah sherry yeah. battle was her name uh, and she paid me to just talk to her and, and ask her questions and let mm-hmm. her talk about stuff and so um there really is and that's helped me to have really strong relationships so then coming into mm-hmm. with with shonda i'd already had that kind of that history of engaging and asking questions and yeah um I remember when we did in that first movie, we interviewed Shonda and her husband mm-hmm. and they had been separated. He had been drinking and um, they were, she was doing the tough love and they were separated and we did an interview with them and it was pretty intense. And I remember in the car on the way back from the cabin, mm-hmm. you said that was like a therapy session. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. And, uh, and so, and it was. And around that time too, I remember you and mom were starting to go to counseling more regularly as well. So it was probably fresh on your mind and you were learning how to talk to couples because you were being talked to. Yes. In case you didn't realize it, you're listening to a really nice guy. The Rick Altizer Show on Bot Radio, 89.1 FM, 1160 AM, Nashville. So there's so many life experiences that... If somebody listening to this is young, in, in their early 20s or something, sometimes it's kind of frustrating because you see in your head what you want to achieve in your 20s, but you know, you're, you have all this experience in the music industry as a storyteller, as a therapist, as a person who listens. You've got you know, 40 years on a 20-year-old in terms of just life experience, and I think it's fascinating, too, that you've stumbled into documentaries because you don't necessarily need to be a cinematographer to shoot a documentary. Um, but you do need to understand how to capture good audio. And of course, as a producer, a music producer, that was the one thing that you really could do. So it kind of worked out perfect that it was a perfect marriage and a perfect storm of preparation over your lifetime of being a good listener, a good communicator and also understanding story, I think that is a crucial thing that you may 
not have even thought about that. I just recently kind of realized if you've never seen a movie before, how do you know how a movie works? Like you saw so many films that it was just part of your natural language of like understanding how a story is told through uh, film. Um, all those things combined, like make, and you watched a lot of music documentaries. I know that for sure. <laughs> so you understood how good documentaries are made, how good story was made and how good audio is captured. Mm -hmm. All those things combined, you can even leave out the visual aspects. That's just kind of secondary. And, uh, with that first, with those first two or three movies, I kind of helped you with, with that. And, uh, you eventually started working with John Melton and Dave Oglesby with this recent, uh, film, uh, my buddies Jeffrey Holland and Nick Serbin helped you with some of them as well. And Dakota, I think, shot some stuff. So um, the visual aspect is almost secondary. And I think a lot of people listening may think they obsess over the lenses and the cameras and the lighting. And you look at a lot of the HBO documentaries and the films that are on Netflix and the documentaries are really well shot and they look like films. But sometimes they're empty. They don't have any depth yeah, to them. They're beauty pieces. They're beauty pieces. So yep. um and the, the film, the documentary films that typically uh, win Oscars are more focused on the on the story. And that's the most you yeah. know crucial part. So before we get into all the technical, um, can you talk about that and how you develop a good story first? Or even I don't even know how a documentary is really made. I mean, you can't really write it necessarily. Yeah, well, uh, I just do want to say, too, you're mentioning a bunch of photographer, <laughs> uh, c cinematographers that were helping with me. But you did leave out one very important person whose name was David Altizer, who was <laughs> my director of photography. So, yeah, great, yeah, yeah. great visuals from my son. It's great having a talented filmmaker as a son because that <laughs> helped so much to well. make my my uh, little documentaries actually look like uh, films. But, yeah, you know, as far as story goes, I had this conversation with the Kendrick brothers who had never made a documentary before. You know, they've made uh, feature length films, uh, Courageous, Fireproof, War Room, Overcomer, mm -hmm. uh, Facing the Giants, you know, very popular Christian films and that you, were all scripted. And your most recent film, Show Me the Father, is produced by the Kendrick brothers. Yeah, they, they, so. we, they, they, they were the executive producers of yeah. it. And um, so uh, this is their first foray into documentary. And so what I told them, because they were mentioning that same thing about stories, I said, Every documentary you make, you think it's going to be one thing and you start filming it. And I promise you, it will become something else. It will mm. change. It, it will not be what you think. It's it's a we have a topic. We're going to talk about the fatherhood of God. We're going to talk about fatherhood. And so we know it's going to be that topic, but we're not going to know. Mm -hmm. It's not like a scripted piece where you know what you're going to end up with. Because I'm going to sit down and talk to somebody and I think I know what we're going to talk about, but you never know where it's going to go. So yeah. you have to keep that open mind to let the documentary do what it wants to do. We started out with Shonda Pierce. It was going to be a movie about a Christian comedian. She's the top selling female comedian in history, mm -hmm. got an award from the RIAA. So what's the top selling female comedian in history? What's her life like on the road as a comedian? Well, this whole other story happens with her daughter, not being, a, being estranged from her, her husband being distraught, starting to drink, an alcoholic. And then as we're making the movie, mm -hmm. he literally drinks himself to death and dies mm -hmm. in the middle of while we're filming this doc. Yeah. So it became a whole other movie. And you have to be mm -hmm. aware. You have to be sensitive. You have to be listening so um, that that movie that he's referring to is Shonda Pierce laughing in the dark. You can see it, I think, on Prime. Amazon Prime. Yeah, it's Amazon there. Amazon Prime, if you like. To Don't see judge it. me. There's a lot of. That's it's the my first, first one. one. So the story, <laughs> the storytelling is fabulous, and the, like you said, I mean, the things that happened were insane. But um, yeah, it was the first one. Me so. with a. a T3i and a Sigma lens on autofocus. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I I want to correct you every time you say that. The T3i did not have autofocus for video. You would push it halfway, it would focus, and then you hit record and it stops autofocusing. So you didn't even have autofocus back then. Oh, maybe that's why it was going out of focus. <laughs> because it, it doesn't move. Yeah, it doesn't have dual pixel autofocus on it. So, so when you see it and you see the, the stuff going in and out of focus, <laughs> that's that's me filming. It's Well, yeah. So the T3i, yeah, you, you push the button to record. It focuses <laughs> on your subject when you hit record, but then once it's recording, it doesn't focus anymore. That's funny. That's yeah. funny. So, so, so anyway, back. Uh, yeah. So, so that's kind of with story <laughs> is that you, you have an idea, mm -hmm. but you can't go in with a scripted piece or an idea. You mm -hmm. can't make it too 
to exact because unless things you're doing change. A, unless you're doing like a uh, you know E Entertainment will do like a the history of the '80s rock and roll, yeah, sure. And then they just interview uh, the guy from Poison and right. uh, you know a couple of people, and they say, "Hey, talk about uh, Van Halen, you know, right. or whatever." And then they just kind of whatever. But that's a different type of documentary, sure. right? Yeah, so. and, and there's also uh, you know maybe more political things that might have a, a, a slant. And so you're wanting to talk about something specific, mm-hmm. uh, those, informational things. Those food documentaries, you know, it's yeah. all about, you know, this one topic and they have all these statistics. Right. And Eating sugar is bad for you. And so I'm going to make a documentary on how bad sugar is for you. Sure. So, so I mean, there's different kinds of, of things. But even in that, mm-hmm. the, things will morph and change. And you've got to be, you know, yeah. w- willing to follow it because it can become something different. And that's the beauty of it. Mm-hmm. What I found... Uh, what the first documentary I did was with Shonda was that I was asking her questions that she had hadn't really talked about before. Mm-hmm. So what made it powerful was that she was processing mm-hmm. as we're talking mm-hmm. and you're seeing her discover something about herself that she might not have vocalized before. And that is so powerful. If you can, if you can, have a conversation with someone. So are we, do you want to talk about technical yet or wh- where do you want to go from here? Yeah. I mean, we're just finishing that this one point, which is again, compared to the Kendrick brothers with a narrative film, every single moment is completely planned out because it is all dependent on the budget and every minute that you're wasting is a waste of money. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you have a crew that's there to light a scene exactly how it needs to be shot The actors perform exactly as the script is written. They go from point A to point B. There's literally tape on the ground for where they're supposed to stand. And the focus puller will pull focus, not even looking at the screen, just based on data and numbers, based on how far the subject is from the lens. So every single thing down to the positioning of the people is completely planned out. Um, I mean, they they blast light through a window to simulate sun so that they don't rely on the sun. Uh, for their lighting, you know, so that's complete contrast to a documentary, which is what you're saying, right? Which is, you may have a s- somewhat idea what you're doing, but for the most part, the subjects that you're interviewing may completely steer and deter what your plan originally was for the documentary. Yes. So, yeah. so, so what I do when I do the interviews, because I'd, I'd really love to talk about the interview process. Well, that's my next question. Okay, great. Here yeah. we go. <laughs> I'm asking the questions yeah, here. All right, all uh, right, son. <laughs> so, what is the best way to interview someone? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, here, here's, here's what I've learned. Um, when I sit down with someone, I, I will tell them, we're just going to have a, a conversation. I, I say, this is like you and I are at Starbucks or at your favorite restaurant, mm-hmm. and we're sitting down and we're having a conversation. A lot of times you'll interview people who might be professional speakers. You know, yeah. They might be uh, uh, musicians or actors, or, mm-hmm. and being on is part of their job. Well, you had, they, yeah, you had Tony Evans, who's a professional speaker. He's got his own cadence, the way he he's speaks. He's a pastor. He, he can get into pastor <clears throat> mode. He can get into... Uh, teaching mode and preaching mode. And he's used to speaking on a stage in front of a thousand people. So it's a different performance than on an intimate and it's camera. A, and, in the it's lens. A, and it's an excellent, he's an excellent communicator, uh-huh. but he, he can be very over, you know, very much in, in, a, in a mode. And so yeah. when I sat down with Tony, I said, you know, you have this thing you do mm-hmm. when, when you're on the platform and it's wonderful and it's great. I want to be very affirming. I say, but what I'm looking for is just, a very intimate conversation mm-hmm. to where, and then I would even say to where you're not on, mm-hmm. you're just Tony. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you and I are at Cracker Barrel uh-huh. and just having a conversation. I love Cracker Barrel. And Tony being the consummate pro that he was, I love Cracker Barrel too. Yeah, biscuits, macaroni, uh, come cheese. Come on. <laughs> Tony being the pro that he is, he totally got that. Yeah. And I've had many people. He nailed people, it too. And I've had people who have worked with Tony who, mm-hmm. who, who, uh, videotape Tony. And, I mean, I've videotaped Tony. Yeah. I went to Baltimore with Tony. And, yeah, <laughs> the hottest and so, week of the entire uh, <laughs> decade. Uh, I, ha- I had crabs with Tony oh, they, and his yeah. friend in Baltimore <laughs> with his parents um, years when ago. they were alive. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. amazing. Mm-hmm. That's so funny, the, 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 the points of contact that we have. It's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he, I've had people say that in that, in that film that they heard uh, 
a tone from him that they they don't they haven't heard before. A Tony tone, a Tony tone. Will. And we got a Tony um, tone. So so being able to to have them feel comfortable, yeah, to have him feel uh, vulnerable, mm-hmm. um, and so I don't uh, I don't do a pre interview mm-hmm. with them uh, because I don't want it to be something that's rehearsed. That mm-hmm. then they I ask them again, and now they've already said it once. So now it's now they're performing it, yeah, instead of communicating it. So I don't go in with. A pre-interview. Yeah, I'll uh, like with Sherman Smith, the one of the guys, main characters in uh, the Show Me the Father documentary. Mm-hmm. We had lunch together and we got to know each other. And that's but, a great idea. But to I, do that. but I didn't talk about if he started getting into the story. I said, you know, let's wait. Save it. Let's wait because <laughs> I wanted to get it fresh. Yeah. You know, well, I found with the podcast that I host, like having a pre-talk, especially with somebody you've never met, um, can really get them off you know and and just by dis- disarming them with normal questions like what'd you eat for lunch today instead of going straight to the point uh can get them to be more normal um and i think the best guy in the world at this is joe rogan if you've ever listened to joe mm-hmm. rogan he does these two and a half hour podcasts with elon musk and he's able to get so uh, intimate and normal with these superstars um, because he just cuts straight to the chase and also just kind of throws them off, you know, mm-hmm. but anyways. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, I think, um, being able to be relational with him, I don't go in with notes. Mm-hmm. I don't have a notepad on my lap that I'm looking down at while they're talking. I'm looking down, looking away. Yeah. You know, I'm keeping eye contact the entire conversation, mm-hmm. which can be exhausting. You yeah. know, you can do a three hour interview sometimes. And when that interview is done, I mean, I'm yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not. I can't show it, but I am wiped out because I'm eye to eye, eye contact the whole time. And if they're talking about something that was scary, I'm making a scary face. And if they're, <laughs> you know, if they're talking about something humorous, I'm giving a big smile and a laugh. And I'm making sure mm-hmm. they're feeling validated, they're being heard. Mm-hmm. But I'm also listening. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm listening very carefully because I'm hearing what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Because then that's going to, you know, that's going to lead into the next question based on what they're saying. And they might c- say something that I know is connecting with another person who said something. Mm-hmm. And then I can help them connect some dots. I'll say, you know, that reminds me of this, this, this and that. Would you mind commenting on that? Mm-hmm. And so then they can can say back. But so much of the interview is being in the moment, paying attention, listening and um, asking probing questions, mm-hmm. um, one of the things I, I uh, like to say is you can give me information. That's one conversation. Here's what happened. You know, that's, that's a conversation. Mm-hmm. How did you feel? How did that make you feel? Mm-hmm. You know, how did you – that's a whole other conversation. That's the human element that is so crucial to convey emotion, for people to feel connected to the subjects. Um, and there's a difference between Jimmy Fallon on The Tonight Show asking questions and being a, an interviewer for a documentary. Even the 60 Minutes guys always come in with some sort of angle, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, you look at tele- – you don't want to study podcasters and TV show hosts uh, on interviewing for a documentary. You want to study the best documentaries ever made and think about the questions that were asked of these people – um, it's a different skill set than Jimmy Fallon on the tonight show mm-hmm. because he's, I've noticed because I study yeah. him, like he's just going point to point entertainment, comedy, fu- you know, the, he's not really thinking about the well, overarching story. When, when that guest shows up, they have a publicist mm-hmm. who gives Jimmy Fallon, here are the questions we want you to ask. Sure. You know, we want to talk about this and oh, by the way, this, this, this artist had this situation in his life that's just like the situation in the movie, mm-hmm. and so they'll they'll there's there's mm-hmm. a list, and and you've or if got it's a comedian, them. they have they'll plan a joke, you know. Right. Jimmy will set up a, a thing, and then the comedian has a punchline. Right. Right. You know? The whole thing's set up. It's all set up. And I get. I mean, I've done lots of interviews on my show, and I've had publicists set up, you know, filmmakers and actors and authors. And there's a list of questions for me to ask, which mm-hmm. I don't ever do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I never. I mean, they're there to talk about their movie. They're they're on my show to talk about their book and their movie. So I always want to, you know, honor that and, and talk sure. about their movie. They're, hey, it's going to be in theaters this coming Friday or whatever. Um, but uh, you like getting down the nitty gritty. Yeah, well, you know, getting 
what's the real story there? What what is the human element? How do uh, how do you feel? <clears throat> how do these things make you feel? And then to communicate those feelings, uh, you know. And so anyway, <clears throat> all of that. I don't know how you feel, David, but I feel. I feel like this is the end of the show. I feel this has gone so unbelievably fast. I know it's only the, like part one of this thing. Should it's we do amazing. a part two? If I think if you're up to doing a part two, I'm up to doing a part two. All right, I feel like you should do that. All right. Well, <laughs> is that how you feel? That's how I well, feel. That's how your feelings. Uh, my wife would say, "That's not a feeling. That's a that's a that's a thought." Uh, yes, that's... indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, but... join us next week, same time, same place, on the Rick Altizer Show, where I ask questions of my father, Rick Altizer. I'm your host, Dave Altizer, aka Dave Mays. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Dave. If there's a show you've missed, you can go to my website, rickaltizer.com, and catch up. Or you can listen to my podcast in iTunes or wherever you hear your podcasts. Just search for The Rick Altizer Show. I want to thank you for listening. Hey, would you tell a friend about this show and share the love? Be sure to check us out again next week as we discuss how we communicate the gospel through media to our culture. Let's be clear so the world can hear. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening.